Hi, I'm John Barham, developer of the sequence that implements TIA 5050. This is a performance spec that's designed to test the receiving characteristic of a mobile phone to see if there's enough undistorted output to be used in various practical situations. It's designed to be used with an air interface, which is a device to which you place a call with the phone under test and the signals uh, going into the phone are provided to the air interface. The sequence has calibration sequence for that air interface as well as for the hat's ear. You can also see that it uses a positioning device which helps put the phone in the correct place and at the right force. In a moment I'll show you a little bit more about how that works. In the measurements you're going to see today uh, the connection is not to an air interface because this lab does not have one but it's connected to an application on the computer. This means that there's a little bit more in the test than just the cell phone. It's almost like testing a phone back to back. So the performance that you see here is probably a little bit worse than the phone itself had we tested it on an air interface as intended. Nevertheless, I think you'll see exactly how the sequence works. I will walk you through that. So to sum up, the sequence will show if the receiving performance of a cell phone is sufficiently loud and sufficiently undistorted for practical use according to the standard TIA 5050. Once the handset positioner has been set up, here's how to adjust it. With the barrel adjustment, make sure that there's a lot of distance between the handset and the ear. Then there's a locking device here that will firm everything up. And then by looking at the scale, you can adjust the barrel so that the force is what we want. In this case, I'm setting it to two newtons right there. So we'll use two newtons for one set of measurements. When that's done, we're going to change the force to eight newtons, again, by moving the barrel and watching the force gauge. Takes a few turns of the barrel to do this. And if you look straight at the force gauge, it's easy to tell when you are exactly at the right point. So that's the short story about how to adjust the positioner. The first thing we need to do is to say what the bandwidth of our phone is. This is a narrowband phone, so that's what we pick. The next prompt tells you how to navigate the sequence. The standard requires measurements that include frequency response, conversational gain, and distortion to be performed both at 2 newtons and 8 newtons pressure on the handset. They can be performed in any order, but it's usually better to start with 2 newtons. The positioner may, may work better that way. If you need to repeat any one of the sets, you can do so. Now we make sure the handset is set for 2 newtons pressure force and that the call is actually active. The jacket hung on the back of the wide chair. A pound of sugar costs more than eggs. The coffee stand is too high for the couch. The ship was torn apart on the sharp reef. You just heard the IEEE male speech as the test signal. So when we look at these first results, we need to find out if the conversational gain and the frequency response are OK. If you look in the box we just highlighted, you can see conversational gain is fine, but frequency response is not. The free field frequency response, upper left, doesn't pass, although it's close, and neither does the diffuse field frequency response. Again, it's close. When we look at the waveforms in the lower left, we can see four sentences clearly, so the measurement appears to be valid. In this case, we go on to the final test, which is distortion. For distortion, we have two conditioning signals to keep the phone active during the test. The first one is a sentence, and the second one is a syllable called ba that actually is repeated in front of each noise burst. 
You'll hear this in a moment. The jacket hung on the back of the wide chair. If you look at the upper right graph, you'll see the waveforms of the test. The upper left graph shows the spectrum. What you see now is very typical. Something looks like a rectangle at the test frequency. Back to the waveform graph on the upright. The signal up to 2.6 seconds is the sentence conditioning. It's not measured. It's merely made to keep the device active. The burst around 2.8 seconds is the short conditioning. It's to keep the device active during the measurement. The noise signal centered around 3 seconds is the part that's actually measured. And that sequence of pulses goes on for 10 times. As the test progresses, in the lower left-hand graph, you can see two curves. The yellow curve is the signal-to-noise and distortion ratio. It's actually a signal-to-garbage ratio. The green curve above it is measured in a similar way, but it only includes second and third harmonics. So it's just the distortion part, not the noise part. The middle lower graph shows distortion in percentage terms. That might be a bit more familiar. When we look at the distortion results, we could see from the box that the signal to noise and distortion test did not pass, especially between 1 and 2 kilohertz. If we look at some of the other boxes, we can get some information. The lower left, which is level versus frequency, appears normal. The upper right, which is signal to distortion ratio, is much better than signal to distortion and noise ratio. This tells us that most of the garbage in the test was noise, not so much distortion. Now we can go and look at the waveforms for each of those frequencies. The purpose of this is to see if the phone remained active during all of the tests. And at first glance, that seems to be generally the case. You can see the sentence activation, you can see the short activation, and the noise burst. So this appears okay. Now we don't need to go see those curves. Let's measure again at 8 newtons. So here we'll go and actually change the force on the handset, moving it inward for an application force of 8 newtons. You might hear a little noise as the uh, positioner is being changed. The volume control has not been changed from the position it was in before. The jacket hung on the back of the wide chair. A pound of sugar costs more than eggs. The coffee stand is too high for the couch. The ship was torn apart on the sharp reef. So this test is exactly what was happening with two newtons. And so again, if we look at the conversational gain, we can see in this case it did not pass. So we need to make a change in the volume control setting and see if there is a volume control position that will allow this test to pass. We'll go ahead and do that and then measure again. We can keep doing this. The jacket hung on the back of the wide chair. A pound of sugar costs more than eggs. The coffee stand is too high for the couch. The ship was torn apart on the sharp reef. We can keep going in this loop until we get the volume control setting to our satisfaction. In this case, we've got a setting that does allow the conversational gain to pass. But the frequency response, once again, does not. It seems to be a valid measurement, so we're going on to the distortion. The jacket hung on the back of the wide chair. Back, back, back. In the lower right box, 
you can see the frequency that has been tested and is showing on the graph and the application force. If you look again at the upper left graph, you'll see this rectangular shape, which is normal when the test is being performed at a specific frequency. So far, the signal to distortion and noise ratio, the yellow curve in the lower left, is above the 20 dB requirement. But now it dips below. And if you look carefully at the spectrum in the upper left, you may be able to see that there's more noise in there than there was before. In a similar way, at 2 kilohertz, or 1.6 kilohertz, there's more noise in the measurement than there was before. This is noise generated by the device. The jacket hung on the back of the wide chair. Remember that the noise we put into the device should look like a rectangle. Anything else represents some kind of distortion that the device has done. So let's look at these results before we go further. The signal to noise and distortion ratio has not passed, again, particularly between 1 and 2 kilohertz. Once again, if we look at the other graphs, we may get a clue as to what's going on. The signal to distortion ratio, which does not include the noise, is at quite a bit higher. This tells us that the garbage that's produced is mostly noise just like before. So we have the measurements done at both application forces. Now we can look at the summary. Before we decide how to save the data, just look at the screen. The left side is all of the information for 8 newtons. The right side is the information for 2 newtons. On the left side, we can see that the conversational gain has passed, but not the signal to distortion and noise and not frequency response. Similarly, on the right, the conversational gain is fine for 2 newtons, but the frequency response and distortion are not. Now, I'll choose not to save raw data to an Excel sheet. Instead, I'd like us to save data to a master report that goes into a particular format. We can include that word demo in the name of the file, and we can write some notes that will go into the Excel sheet to say anything special that occurred during this test, maybe the volume control positionings. So there's been a little interaction between SoundCheck and Excel, and the uh, test report has been saved.